So let us now call upon the Holy Spirit as we open our hearts wide to, the, to God in this moment of preparation. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have called us to be your people. Gracious Lord, you have sent your Son to demonstrate your love towards your people. And Lord God, we now enter into your sanctuary to worship you, to give you praise and thanks for displaying your love to us, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in which we now pray. Amen. Friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Let us join together in our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Day and night return endlessly, showing God's steadfast love. The law of God is perfect, re reviving the soul. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Come, let us worship God. The, uh, come, let us worship the living God. Amen. 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 Do we have any birthdays today? No? Then perhaps uh, people at home are celebrating a birthday, so may we wish them um, the birthday poem. Many happy returns of the day of thy birth. May sunshine and gladness be given. And may thee, dear Lord, prepare you on earth for a beautiful birthday in heaven. Amen. Amen. I invite us to open our hearts to listen to the, um, the song, um, that I will be uh, playing for us now. We are doing a series on what are we devoted to? What do we live for? So as we are unable to sing together in voice because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I invite us to sing within our hearts. Now, as um, 
I invite Edwina up for the children's message. I invite you to stay where you're seated as Edwina will be leading our children's message. And then after the children's message, if you'd like to go with Danielle to the Sunday school room, you can, you're more than welcome to. We will be wearing masks and we have hand sanitizer and social distancing. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a great week. Before I do the children's story, I thought I'd remind you about our thankfulness pumpkin we talked about last week. If you've had a special blessing this week, are there something that you're really thankful about? There's a marker back there. Write it on the pumpkin. We've got a couple things on here. And then we can just put it up front during in November and Thanksgiving when we're really celebrating our thankfulness for everything. Well, you may have gathered from my talking about pumpkins and stuff that I absolutely love fall. And I think one of the things that we are really lucky in this area is our beautiful fall colors. I guess there are some places that just don't have this, and they're definitely missing one of God's blessings. And I really like leaves. I have leaf coasters on my table. I have leaf placemats. I even have special soap for my bathroom with leaves in it. I just like everything about fall decorating. But let's just talk about the real stars of fall, if I can pick them up. It's not my artificial decorations, it's the actual leaves. And we talked about this once a while ago. In the spring and summer, the leaves are a beautiful shade of green. And everybody just gets so excited. Oh, everything's turning green. There's signs of life. We love it. Then comes fall, and we get kind of your reddish browns and yellows. I didn't have a good selection of pretty colored leaves in my yard. Here's a red one. Here's leaves that are kind of partially turning. Well, maybe you're wondering, why am I talking about the color of leaves? When leaves start out, their natural color, pigment, is the colors you see in the fall. But the chlor chlorophyll that makes them turn green and do all the great and wonderful things they do, it takes over their natural color and just turns them into green. And I was thinking about us. How many things do we have come into our life which might turn us a different color or make us a different person? when deep inside we want to take and live the life Christ lives for us. So as you're seeing all these beautiful leaves, think of the natural beauty and how they are the true colors God wanted them to be. And think what's in your life that might be coloring you that's not making you the true color and the true person Jesus wants you to be. I hope all you kids have a great week at school, and everybody, please stay safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Let us bow and pray. Merciful God, help us become the people you have created us to be. We long for the healing of the nations, but it is easier to harm than to heal. Help us cast aside the things that chain our spirits, that we might might be free to care for one another and fulfill your law of love. Amen. Amen. May we now take a moment to call upon our forgiving Savior as we surrender any brokenness and give praise for the forgiveness that is given to us all now in silence. Let us pray. The one who created us seeks us still, beckoning us into union with Christ. Seek God and receive acceptance through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. May we open our hearts to our song of uh, preparation, My Hope is Built.
Amen. Amen. Let us now celebrate together in God's word. For every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character so that we can be equipped to do everything that is good. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth, on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. May we pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we receive of your word, that we also receive of your spirit. Gracious Lord, as I come to you this day, I pray that you are glorified in spite of my human weaknesses. As we pray all this now in your most glory and magnificent name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Earl. So, good morning, everyone. In this morning's scripture reading, I, um, I chose the New Revised Standard Version. And as you can see, there's some language in that scripture reading that might cause us to step back a little bit and say, oh, that's not the most politically correct, um, most politically correct language. But nevertheless, we find it in our scriptures. And I wanted to say that I want to take this opportunity that as we approach our scripture this morning, that we have um, a lot going on. And I do not intend to make this into a Bible study today. But I wanted to have us kind of feel a little re restless when we heard the scripture reading. And that was in regards to the language of, of, of slave, of slavery. Um, there's always this disclaimer when it comes to our scripture when this word comes about, and it's one I was just spending some time this week in school on. Um, and that is that the idea of um, slavery in ancient time of the Bible does not necessarily fit the demographics of that, of what we, uh, we were faced in our nation not that long ago and the struggles uh, within that even to this day. Um, however, that is not a disclaimer saying that it was okay for that form to exist in the time that this scripture was, um, was created. This is a reminder for us that every, the Bible, our holy text, the word of God, the logos, contains within it, um, um, as we just testified in our, in the opening, uh, uh, our opening scripture, um, we say every week, is useful to, for teaching and for correction. 
Um, however, it is the logos, the, the, the wisdom of God, the spirit of God. We are reminded that the word of God in ancient times of Exodus was given for, to us by p how people viewed God. So everything in the Bible is, is worthy for us to come together and worship in, but not everything in the Bible is set within the mindset of the people being where they're supposed to be. If it was so, we wouldn't have needed the Messiah. So this message, which may seem exclusive to us today, during that time was an inclusive message. And through the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, continues to unite us all together as one people. We can see that the struggle of separation is not a new struggle. And we know that. We know that this has been going on for generations upon generations since the origin of the human species coming together. There is a hierarchy of order. And we see that the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures will often point us to a direction of uneasiness because we have not yet achieved perfection. So when we come to the scriptures and we feel uneasy, we say to ourselves, why am I uneasy with this and where can I be to be reconciled into a new heaven and new earth with my brothers and sisters? Now, the scripture that comes to us today is a continuation of where we started of Moses being called by God to lead the liberation of oppressed people. So there in itself we can see that the message was given to those that were of utmost oppression. And then we find themselves liberated. They found that they were, it's a couple of weeks ago, that they were scared in their liberation and that they seeked the basic necessities. They, were, they hungered, right, for literal food. They thirsted for water and they were fearful that they would die in the wilderness. And yet God provided. This message that I gave a few weeks back is one that I want us to be mindful of today. This message of life, how God is the provider of life for us. And as human beings, we come to, we live, our existence is to be dedicated in life. But yet so often we do things that, are, that just contradict that. We do so many things that lead us into the toxicity of not life, but rather slowly towards death. We are called to be risen people. We are called to be people that to express the empty tomb and new life within the spirit of God. As we continue this series, this, uh, I'm going to be leading us on a series on, on prayer. What is prayer to you? Now, the scripture reading today, believe it or not, is an expression of the Ten Commandments. I decided not to put them up individually listing them, but it is a message of the Ten Commandments, where it tells us the second part, it says you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not commit false witness to your neighbor. And these are all these laws that we find in the Pentateuch, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And we say, okay, these are things that we can live by. But we find that the second part of the Ten Commandments may be ways for us to behave ourselves. It does not come naturally to us if we do not do the first five. And that I will read to you now. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all work. And on the seventh day, uh, the Sabbath um, is the Sabbath to your Lord God. You shall not work. And, and then it was continued that we are to keep this day holy and that we're not supposed to, and when we go to the commandments, that we're not supposed to do all these things towards God. And we see that within these commandments, all these rules that Moses has given to the people, that there are two basic sets. The first one is honoring, worshiping, and being in the presence of God. And the second set, the second part of it, is how do we function once we do the first five? Now this message of doing is something that's very um, embedded in our culture, right? If I do this hard enough, work hard enough on this, I will get somewhere. But unfortunately, I think many of us have forgotten to do the first set of the equation. And that is to spend more time in the presence and the fellowship in soaking in full maturation of our God. Now, 
I can see that I'm, I'm slowly transforming this into a teaching message, and I didn't really want to do that, but I wanted to make the point that when we were given the commandments by God, that we are to, be, to find time to rest in God, to be in God's presence. And once we do that, everything else will come. I'm asking us not to say that these things aren't important in how we follow rules and how we treat our brothers and sisters. What I'm saying is we're going to put that on hold for now because we cannot give to others what we don't have for ourselves. And that gift that we are to receive and to give praise for is an attitude and expression, a message of love in the now. What are you committed to? Are you committed to being joyful? Are you committed to being happy? Are you committed to your job? Are you committed to your family? Now, are these commitments things that are bringing you joy, or are they commitments that slowly steal your joy? This is the, where I'm inviting us to soak and to ponder. Do you hunger for something more, something good. Have you ever hungered for something that was bad? Now, this is a rhetorical question. I don't expect people to, to come forward and to yell it out, but, but have you ever like hungered for something that's not the best for you? And I don't wanna get any product placement in trouble here, but do you ever just crave like a greasy hamburger? Or perhaps a pizza and you're like really hungry, like we're starving? And then you sit down and then you have a couple of extra, maybe, maybe extra too many bites. Or maybe you shouldn't have supersized it. And you're done, you're saying to yourself, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. This was me yesterday when I ordered uh, a sundae, an ice cream and pie along with my meal from McDonald's. I was in repentance soon after because my stomach. I was so hungry and it was so good and then I was like, this is not so good. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? I've been doing so good. I've been eating my salads, right? The cucumbers, all the veggies. I could have ordered the pizza last week, but instead I got, the, I, you know, you, you get the, the healthy dish instead. And then that my mind, I'm craving something. I'll just cheat a little bit. And I had all these emotions of regret. And such a silly little thing. But see, sometimes if we start with the silly little things, it helps us to grow in the bigger things. Paul struggles with this in his letters. He'll share with, his, with the different churches. He says, why do I do these things that I know I shouldn't do, but yet I still do them? We've been given the gift of life. We've been given an expression from God who, who comes to us, who speaks to us. And yet there's so much noise and stuff, the grease that clogs our arteries up here. It's, a, it's an absolute miraculous message of liberation that we see in the Exodus, even when we get stumbled by, by the context of the time. But we see that God spoke to the people and God liberated the people that were being oppressed. And we find ourselves in a land with, with many benefits of freedom and liberties that few have throughout other nations. But yet, I think most of us can admit, maybe deep down in ourselves, that yet we still feel oppressed. We still want something more. We still hunger for something more. I think that we fill ourselves with much noise and much stuff because there's a section in us that hungers for so much more, but yet we just don't know how to get it. You know, I've been working with a, with a covenant group and it's been um, something at first I was um, not looking forward to because I'm very busy and I didn't feel like I had time to work with other people. But we meet every Thursday morning from 9 to 10 and we keep each other accountable by, and we set up a plan of, of attack and how we can spend more time with God. Do you pray? 
And have you ever thought of prayer as the same thing as spending time with God? Would you like to pray, but it's just you can't find time to do it? That's where I am, or that's where I'm, um, I'm coming from. Boy, I'd like to spend more time in intimate time with, with God. But, but although this time isn't, not say it's not intimate, but I, I, have to, I have to pray for my beloved parishioners who are struggling. I need to lift up prayers for Brenda as, she, um, as her heart sorrows for the loss of Tom. I need to pray for those that, and I want to pray for those that I care for as your pastor in this church. And then I need to create the worship study, right? Um, as you can tell, the PowerPoint, I could have spent a little bit more time on that. But I have this time where I'm creating prayers or organizing prayers for all of us here today. See, that's well and good. That's fine. But that's not the same as having intimate time with God. Now, I'd like to have some more intimate time with God, but I just don't have time. And so I'm going to force my way through the week. Does anyone here relate to this? Martin Luther, the great ref reformer, once said, I'm so busy in my duties that if I didn't take three hours a day to pray, I'd never be able to get them done. John Wesley said something similar, except he copped out. He only took two hours a day, as I say facetiously. How can we give, how can we receive if we're not in the presence of life? God breathes to us, nefesh, spirit, soul. As we breathe in, we receive of God. As we exhale, we let go of all the things that deprive us from life. You know, as we clumsily go through this Exodus message of the commandments, it gets bogged down in logistics. And we're mindful that, you know, Jesus gives us two simple rules. When the people asked him, they said, which is the greatest commandment? There's just too many of them. Which is the greatest? And you probably already know this. For Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now you'll notice I left in the little indication A and B, which we'll find if you go on Bible Gateway or our study Bible. And that's making reference to say that Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. Jesus is quoting the first part of the laws. Now, there's a difference, right? I mean, we look at the Torah and all the laws that Moses has given us to live by, but they all stem from these two. Love the Lord your God, God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength or mind. It's the same meaning. And love your neighbor as yourself. Notice the order. I can't possibly love my neighbor, well, I can love my neighbor as myself, but if I don't do the first, then am I truly loving myself? Perhaps one of the reasons that we have such diversity in our nation right now is that we are treating people like ourselves, and you know what? We're not treating ourselves all that great, are we? I wouldn't wish that meal I had on my neighbor. Do you follow what I'm saying? doesn't say love thy neighbor as thyself and then love God. That doesn't work. Because if I love the neighbors how I've been treating myself, then, then, then my neighbor's tired, worn up, beat up, grouchy. But if we start in the presence of, the God, of God and we find time to be in God's presence, now we're starting to receive something that's worthy of giving to others. What are you committed to? I've said this in the beginning of this series. The very fact that you're here today, the very fact that you're joining us online, is that you're searching for something more in life. Now, you might not know what it is, or you very well do know what it is, and you're here just trying to receive it all. But today is the day that we set aside 
to worship, to love, and to embrace life. Good. The good stuff. We try to fill it with the other stuff, but that just bogs us down. Um, in my covenant group, we were talking about uh, we we're talking about one of our covenant groups is to be an expression of liberation to someone that's being oppressed, because everyone in the group is clergy or Christians as you are Christians, and we believe that we are going to hold each other accountable, one of the things that we need to do is to speak out on behalf of others when they're being oppressed in a loving and caring way. Challenging, right? Because we're so diverse, we fight so much. And so people, we were talking in our group, well, maybe, how could I do that? Well, they said, we could start on Facebook. But there's been one problem. We all have given up Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody was apologizing. They're like, well, I can't be a, an encouraging message of hope. I haven't been on Facebook. I said, well, I haven't either. And they all apologized, like, oh, maybe we should go back on. And I'm thinking to myself in this moment that not yet. Not yet. Not until I spend some time in the presence of God. Let me ask you a question. This is a serious question. And it, I'm sure it's different from all of us. How much time do you spend in the presence of your favorite news channel? Whether it be uh, CNN or Fox or MSNBC. You get the idea. Take some inventory. Ask yourself, how much time do I spend in the presence of of local news, national news. This is a serious inventory check for us. Ask yourself, how much time do I spend on social media? Not if it's good, not if it's bad. Just how much time? Could I invite you to take some inventory this week and to, and to, to count up how much time you spend? I did a little experiment yesterday, I was on YouTube. I like YouTube because I get to pick and choose what I want to watch, right? When I want to watch it. And I was on, and there was this guy that's um, going to read the news. And I noticed it was a 10, I think it was 5 to 10 minute clip. And I watched it, and he read the, the national news. Just read the news. We heard, we mentioned, that as we lift up prayers for our president and for his wife, that he's been affected with um, the COVID-19 talked about different um, issues that are taking place throughout the world. Five to ten minutes. I stopped watching. I said, oh my goodness. I said, how much time do I spend listening to everybody else's opinion on the news rather than just getting what I need to know to get on with my day? I'm not asking us to be ignorant to what's going on in society. Heaven forbid. But rather, how much time do we spend in that? I realized I was able to get the lowdown in five minutes. I think, you, I hope, I pray that you're following where I'm going with this. Now take that time that you've taken inventory in and ask yourself, could I take 15 minutes out of that? 15 minutes a day to silence myself. Our, I'm going to propose to us today, and this is not just my proposal. It comes to me. It comes from other other places, other sources, and it comes from my. It does come from my personal experience. The key to prayer. The key to prayer, and you may say, "Wow, what's the key to prayer?" Because that's a hard one. The key to prayer starts in silence. I don't know how to pray. I'm not sure how to say it. I'll say the Lord's Prayer. Or I'll lift up prayers of petition for my children or for my spouse or for my, the people I love. That's all well and good, but it doesn't start there. It starts in silence. The Old Testament tells us it starts in a whisper, in a gentle, silent whisper, that God's not in the storm. God's voice is in the storm or God's voice isn't in the earthquakes around us, but in that stillness.
My professor in one of my classes, uh, Dean Lee, was sharing, I and mean, I shared this with the group, but I want to share it with you again, that he wanted to go running. But he said, I could never have enough, I could never have enough willpower to go running in the morning, every day. Just the thought of it. But he says, I can go walking. And he says, so every day I go for a walk. And every day that walk turns into a run. But I'd never be able to go for a daily run. Do you relate? I'm the same way. Every day, I'm going to go for a walk. And then Barbie comes home from work and says, you ready to walk the dog? And I'm thinking, maybe tomorrow. But then I put my shoes on and say, all right, let's go. Would you be willing to spend 15 minutes a day with God? I'm not asking you to spend an hour. I'm not asking you to spend two hours. But would you be willing to try something for 15 minutes? I'm asking you not. <laughs> this is a challenge, guys. This is hard. Especially if you've got a mind like mine with a bunch of squirrels. To spend 15 minutes trying to silence yourself. I, I would like, I'm just curious if somebody would raise their hand. Are you the kind of person that like starts reading a book and then you know, something will remind you of something and next thing you know you're off somewhere else and you keep reading anyway? And you're like, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did I end up way over here? Are you the kind of person that just wants to, you know what, I'm going to try spending some quiet time with God, and next thing you know, you're thinking about a birthday party that's coming up, or a wedding, or an engagement, or, or uh, something that happened two years ago because one, one thought just entered in your mind. It, it, I, I don't know. I don't, for me, I have this kind of obsessiveness to my thought. What if my thoughts started becoming in those 15 minutes, and rather of distractions of obsessiveness, but obsession upon God? What if these wandering thoughts were wandering towards God? So it's not caught up into this. People say, how do you know when God's talking to you? You ever have your mind wander? And you say, well, Barry, that's just a daydream. Have you ever had your mind wander on God? That's a revelation. I want to hear God's word in my life. I want to hear God's word. In, I want to know. Have you ever daydreamed? Well, pastor... That's just a daydream. Have you ever daydreamed on God? That's a message of liberation. I uh, shared this with you guys a long time ago. This is my song bowl. Um, one of my friends in the Covenant group shared, and I didn't get permission to share this story, so I'm not going to share this person's name. But she, uh, she was so inspired by doing some of these prayers that we're doing in a class that she went to her church last Sunday and shared it with them. And when the service was over, the parishioner grabbed her, well, not literally because of the pandemic, but grabbed her, pulled her aside, and told her that she could not believe that you were bringing in heretic, heretic type of prayers to a Christian church. And she, you know what she led them on? A breath prayer. A breath prayer. We've done breath prayers. We're going to do one quick before communion. This is how I started to learn how to silence myself. Is with this song bowl. People say, well, that's a Buddhist thing, right? No, it's not. It's a bowl. And this bowl is, helps me get my mind off of this crazy stuff and it brings me into centering with God. And you know how it does it? Watch. My mind is so noisy that it takes a little noise to get me out of it. So I put my attention to this bowl. And as the chime begins to go down, I allow my mind to wander into nothingness. And as I do that, and as you do this, when you first start doing it, you get a little uneasy because we are noisy. And I let the sound of the sound bowl as it becomes quiet to bring me into serenity. And as soon as I start thinking about that thing I gotta do, I hit it again. I'm not worshiping a bowl, I'm not worshiping another god. I'm using this as a tool to bring me into a silent meditation, reflection, relationship with God. I wanna continue bringing us into this lesson on prayer. And, but before we can do any of this together, we need to start here. I found this on YouTube. This is a breath prayer. 
You've done breath prayers. My breath prayer is simple. It's as I breathe in, Yode Vahe, out Elohim. Yode Vahe is Lord, capital Lord, God in Hebrew. Elohim is my God. My God. That's all I'm saying is God, God. But isn't it beautiful? Yode Vahe, Hebrew name of God, Elohim. Now, most people don't do a breath prayer like that. They'll say something like, Lord God, have forgiveness on my soul. A lot of times breath prayers like to have a prayer of petition. But I want us to break that prayer of petition in this moment, which I think is fine, you can do it. But I want us to have a prayer of, of absorbing God's goodness. My God, you are so good. And if we do this, we become concentrating on our body, which is a creation of God that God has called good, and we begin to meditate on God. We are noisy. Noise in the background helps center us away from outside noises, bringing us into God. Breathe in. Then breathe out. It doesn't have to be over-exaggerated. Lord God, my Redeemer. My God, my peace. My God, my serenity, and our God within our community. You get the idea. This is not a lecture on how to do it A, B, or C, but rather an example on how we can center ourselves. Now, I have a lot more I want to share with us on this, and I'm asking you, will you start here? Will you try this this week? Take some inventory. How much time do I spend on noise and am I willing to give 15 minutes? Do you know when I do this act every night before bed, I do this. I, um, I find myself sometimes an hour, hour's worth of prayer, but I start here. So I'm not going to surrender the message today. I'm going to invite us to continue this message as we go to the communion table and receive of God. The fellowship and the communion of God in our lives. What if we hunger for God as much as we hunger for the noise? So I invite us to go on this journey together and to silence ourselves. I ask that we lift up prayers of joys and concerns now, within voice or in the silence of our hearts. Gracious Lord, you know all the prayers and petitions within our hearts, and we pray that you be with us as we begin this new week, as you lead us into a closer relationship with you. Help us to silence the noise that's all around us. We pray, Lord, for the leadership of this nation. We pray for the health of all people, from all, different, um, from all the different things of which they suffer. We pray for the leadership within our president, the first lady, and all of those that have been diagnosed with the COVID uh, virus. And we pray, Lord, that as a nation, that we watch out for one another as caring family. We pray for all of those that are oppressed, Lord. We pray for peace. May you show us how we can be a vessel of peace. As we pray this now in the full confidence of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you all. And as we lift up our tithes and offerings, and if those at home would like to do so, you may do so electronically um, at gracesri.org, or you can mail um, your offering to Grace United Methodist Church, Chen Park Ave, Wesley, Rhode Island. Um, let us now join in our uh, celebration song. <laughs>
blessings that you have bestowed upon our life. We ask, Lord, that you, as you accept our offering, that you send your blessing upon it, that it may go forth and change the lives of all those that it meets. As we pray in your most holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be with you. Also. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty. You have formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When, our, when we have turned away and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your pro prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in this unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, the earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, O oh God, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. <clears throat> Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, again gave thanks to you, O oh God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Gracious God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts gathered here and on us, we thank you. Make these be the bread and cup of Christ. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may go forth in the world in the body and spirit, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, and one to the ministry of all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, may we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to take your communion, and as a clear piece of plastic, remove that first before the aluminum part. That's the communion wafer. Behold the body of Christ given for you all. You're now invited to remove the second piece. Behold the blood of Christ that has been shed for us all. Amen. Open our hearts to our closing hymn, Be Still My Soul.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.